Good evening and welcome to Metro Focus. I'm Jenna Flanagan. We begin tonight in Washington and the showdown over President Trump's embattled Supreme Court nominee, Brett Kavanaugh. Having previously shown restraint, President Trump has gone on the offensive ahead of tomorrow's pivotal public hearing on Capitol Hill, where for the first time we'll hear firsthand from Dr. Christine Blasey Ford, the woman who has accused Kavanaugh of sexual misconduct decades ago. Kavanaugh will also testify and is expected to continue to adamantly deny the allegations. At the UN this week, President Trump unleashed on the Democrats, and he questioned the accounts of both Dr. Ford and Deborah Ramirez, a second woman who has also accused Kavanaugh of sexual misconduct. 36 years ago, nobody ever knew about it, nobody ever heard about it, and now a new charge comes up, and she said, well, it might not be him, and there were gaps, and she said she was totally inebriated, and she was all messed up, and she doesn't know it was him, but it might have been him. Oh, gee, let's not make him a Supreme Court judge because of that. This is a con game being played by the Democrats. The Senate Judiciary Committee has scheduled a vote on Kavanaugh's nomination for Friday, just one day after the hearing, a move that the ranking Democrat on the committee, Dianne Feinstein, called, quote, outrageous. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, meanwhile, believes Kavanaugh's confirmation is imminent. Uh, we're going to be moving forward. I'm confident we're going to win. Do you have 50 votes to confirm Judge Kavanaugh? I believe he'll be confirmed, yes. But that confidence has been thrown into doubt after Republican Senator Lisa Murkowski, a potential swing vote in the nomination, seemed to waver in her support in an interview with The New York Times. With the narrow majority, the Republicans can't afford many defectors, setting up a very high-stakes hearing tomorrow morning. Joining me now to preview it all is Daniel Strauss, national politics reporter at Politico. Daniel, welcome to Metro Focus. Thanks for having me. So first off, I want to start, before we even get into the accusations that we know about, uh, news has broken that Stormy Daniels' uh, lawyer, Michael Avenatti, is now claiming that he has a third accuser. He's revealed her identification, who is also accusing uh, Brett Kavanaugh of sexual misconduct. Does this at all play into at least the conversation around tomorrow's hearings? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to see how these new allegations don't come up during the hearings. And what, what Avenatti put out was a pretty graphic portrayal of uh, Brett Kavanaugh and his friend Mark Judge in high school and uh, these sexual misconduct uh, episodes. It's, it's surprising and it will further add to questions during uh, Lazy Ford's testimony tomorrow. I, I really don't know how, mu how much any new allegations will slow down a vote on him. Senate Republicans seem pretty bent and pretty sure that they have the numbers and support despite any other questions or any other accusations that they'll be able to confirm Kavanaugh in the next few days. And of course, as I alluded to in the intro, that we have heard Mitch McConnell essentially say that this is going to be happening. Now, given the fact that they're still going to be holding this, does this make tomorrow's hearing more of a formality or more of something to sort of perhaps appease people who might be upset when, again, we've heard from Mitch McConnell, he believes he has the votes and that Kavanaugh will be put on the Supreme Court. Yeah, I mean, look, there's holding a hearing does give McConnell the ability to say, hey, we had a hearing, we heard these accusations out, and that didn't convince enough of the members of the Senate to vote against Kavanaugh. But uh, at the same time, it really, really is not going to be a cakewalk for the GOP. Uh, uh, this hearing is going to be the most talked about and the most attended event tomorrow, this week, maybe even this month in Washington, D.C. And what's said, what's, what happens, and really President Trump's response is going to create a ripple effect that's going to come up throughout the rest of the midterms all the way through November. Now, is there any uh, consideration, again, to the optics of all of this? Uh, of course, a lot of people have compared this upcoming hearing to the previous hearing of Anita Hill, and that here we had a woman who was uh, making an accusation of sexual misconduct in the workplace, and she was facing a Senate panel of all white men. Uh, again, it, we would have the same thing, except this time the Republican Party has hired an outside counsel, a woman, to come in and do the questioning. Does that change the dynamics of this at all? 
mean, the move to bring this outside counsel, I think, really is an attempt to set to differentiate these hearings from the immediate hearing. But I don't think if, if Democrats have any say in it, they're going to try and liken this to Anita Hill as much as possible, or sort of, uh, or something even worse than it. Um, but at the same time, I it's just not it's not ideal optics for the party that's trying to confirm confirm a Supreme Court nominee. Well, of course, uh, as you said, it's going to be very talked about and all eyes will be on Dr. Blasey Ford tomorrow morning. Is there something that we should expect to see from her or things that you can expect that she will be most judged for? And by that, I mean, in terms of her demeanor, the uh, way her voice sounds. Does she sound confident? Does she sound nervous? Um, how she appears on camera? How much does all of that play into at least the public person, the public's perspective of her believability? I mean, I think, I don't think that there's going to be a huge amount of judgment on whether her voice cracks at a specific moment or whether she's emotional. I think a lot of it is going to be about how she responds to questions and how questions are asked to her. If they're overly aggressive, if they ask for unnecessarily graphic detail, if they question her credibility, or they go on tangents to try and poke holes in whether she is an actual serious witness to her if she's motivated by uh, being a Democrat and uh, being pressed into this uh, as a possible mode to derail a Republican nominee for uh, the Supreme Court. All right, so then for the handful of Republicans who may or may not be swing votes on this, uh, is there any indication that Mitch McConnell might lose? How many votes, first of all, can Mitch McConnell lose and still get Brett Kavanaugh through? And is there any indication that he might have his count wrong? Not that many. And look, uh, McConnell rarely has his counts wrong on votes like this. Uh, it happens once in a blue moon. We thought that uh, the late Senator John McCain would join the rest of his party to vote for Obamacare review, and that didn't happen, but it's very rare. And McConnell can only lose one or two votes. I really, really doubt that the big swing votes, the ones, the big question mark votes, like Susan Collins, are actually in the end going to vote again. Collins has signaled that even though she's undecided on this, she's had personal promises um, from Kavanaugh on sticking points like uh, Roe v. Wade. Uh, but again, uh, Ford's accusations, this third accuser, does call into question, puts added pressure on a lot of members of the Senate of whether they should, they're able to vote for Kavanaugh or not. So it's conceivable, but I, I don't think it's a shame. You mentioned earlier about uh, how the president reacts might also play into this. Now, of course, the president being at the UN General Council did address the at least the second accuser and went on the attack in a way that we've seen him do before, where uh, she must not know what she's talking about. She is incorrect. This is part of a democratic conspiracy to smear Brett Kavanaugh. Does that play into any of this at all? I mean, if, you, if President Trump tweets during the hearings, uh, I think there will be a shift in attention. I think for White House staff, there is a sense of relief that the president will be distracted more due to the TV in the resident during these uh, That could be potentially disastrous and further complicated this conflict. Now, of course, staying at the U.N., he gave a speech that usually gets him a lot of applause when he's at one of his rallies. But in front of the general counsel, there was audible laughter. What does that say about the United States and its standing with the rest of the world? I mean, look, I think it was a little surprising, not just for President Trump, but for most Americans watching this, because this, this was a line that he makes all the time. And he's also constantly raging about how uh, his predecessors are being laughed at. The world is laughing. So to see President Trump actually spark amusement by the world stage was, I think, a little ironic. Um, and President Trump tried to play it off pretty coolly. He said that that was the deliberate line to try and elicit some chuckles. Uh, but beyond that, I, I, I think Trump's opponents will point to that as a sign that even though Trump says uh, they were being laughed at before his administration. 
All right, well, listen, I want to thank you so much for joining us to cover all of these uh, breaking news events. And, of course, to give us a preview of what we can expect to be a very closely watched, very closely dissected Senate hearing tomorrow morning. Um, we look forward to having you back on the show. Thanks for having me.